Hi, I'm Philip Beither, Senior Curator for the Performing Arts here at the Walker Arts Center. And today I have with me John Jaspers, who uh, created and choreographed uh, a brand new work that we helped co-commission called Truth, Revised Histories, Wishful Thinking, and Flat Out Lies. And I had it here to make sure I didn't exactly. miss anything. <laughs> um, a really intriguing new work um, that we had the Minneapolis premiere last night of, and you have two more performances mm -hmm. um, here in the McGuire Theater. First time John and the company have performed in this space. Um, and John, I'd like to start with a question which I know everyone has been asking you, but I'll, I'll narrow it down a little bit about the title and how it reflects the nature, the, some of your original thinking about the work. Um, the, the two parts I'm interested, clearly truth and flat out lies um, is fairly evident uh, in some of the ideas you're investigating. Um, tell me about revised histories and wishful thinking, its relationship <laughs> to the work. Um, you know, when I thought about this work originally and I was thinking about these ideas, it did seem to me that, you know, like uh, truth and lies seem to be this sort of um, absolutist fiction uh -huh. um, that, you know, was, mm, existed outside of time. Right. Um, hmm. And then it seemed to me to be interesting in the way in which um, memory and... Uh, aspiration hmm. was related to that, both in terms of like memory being related to revised histories and the way in which like we have an absolute sense of like how something was hmm. um, that is ultimately colored by our own perceptions at that time, but our own sense of how we're making sense of that um, hmm. complexity and maybe messy complexity of what occurred and we want to make it into a history that somehow has uh, meaning to us, right? Um, and so that oftentimes, you know, changes how what kind of details we forget about, mm. Um, mm. and which ones we tend to dwell on, and that also relating towards um, how we see, you know, the future ahead of us. Uh, um, huh. How how those aspirations for what we think we want to occur. Um, shape what we think is potentially possible mm. um, in both positive and negative ways. I mean, mm. I wanted to say that in a way I think this work really came out of a realization that, you know, like uh, desire or um, imagination for a certain kind of situation is a really powerful thing. Mm. And it's something that allows us to take action. We have to kind of like believe that something is possible in order to do anything. Um, and in fact, some of the big changes in terms of history, in terms of when, when things shift and when suddenly new kind of social paradigms or political paradigms take place. It's all about people suddenly, the critical mass of people actually believing that something is possible, mm. making it actually possible. So realizing that there's this enormous power and necessity for that and mm. trying to sort of parse out where, where that kind of the power of imagination is really moving us forward and when it is, is in some way a big part of what keeps us from actually recognizing how things are. Was, right. a, was a big, those kinds of questions were really at the center of, of starting thinking about what this work could be huh. and where it could go. I wondered if you could talk for a minute in, in um, I, I so enjoyed uh, having read and talked with you about the work, um, and, and finally having a chance to see it live last night. and. Uh, and you know, it, it, um, the critique is, is very clear around, and the, the questions of how we, how we determine what it is we believe, um, particularly in a theatrical work in, mm -hmm. in this instance. Um, uh, but I'm wondering how you approach the question of the power or the positive side of that constructed belief system mm -hmm. and how it evidenced itself in the work last night. Versus the critique, say. Right. The, yeah, 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 yeah. That's a really tricky question. 
for me. Yeah. I think it's probably tricky, more tricky for me because I tend to be um, the kind of person who much more easily invests in critique uh -huh. right. um, than in really easily investing in positive affirmation of like, this is so great. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm the sort of person who's like the first person yeah. to sort of like, well, what's wrong with this? <laughs> you know, even when something feels really right or good, I think that I have a tendency to kind of immediately go to that place. Right. Um, which tells you something about me, maybe that's evident from the work as well as um, from anybody who's interacted with me. But I do think that, that um, you know, when we get to certain things, particularly in the second half of the piece, um, but also in other places where, I, 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 for instance, just personally thinking about my own work, because I feel like I'm somebody who has had a really complex and ambivalent relationship to dance mm -hmm. and dance making. I'm somebody who... Would you say you would extend that even to the theatrical artifice in general, or theater? Yeah, and, absolutely. You know, any live absolutely. performance? I would say to live performance, but I think it's particularly in relationship to dance. And, and you know, over, over the past 15 years, we've seen a big emergence of um, what some in Europe might call non-dance, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, to right. call it, where there's some been a real examination to, of like, what does it mean to present virtuosic events and that, like m have people sit in seats and look right. at people do fancy things. And it's a kind of questioning that I feel really connected to. Mm. Um, and yet, I also feel like I sit in this no man's land in between two camps um, where I've continued to invest in that and continue to really believe in the power of it mm. um, and believe that uh, like a sophisticated body isn't necessarily a bad thing mm. um, or having information isn't necessarily a bad thing um, about how we, you know, so how we move and how we embody our mm. bodies. Um, and so I feel like I've, one of the things that has been true in my work is the thing of like returning to dance and then pushing it away. Right. And, and that tension existing inside of my work has been something that's happened, like, a, you know, been a very, very long term right. thing. It's not unique to any one work. Um, in this piece, I made this decision at the end of the work to end with what I felt like was an attempt at a much more um, direct and um, unquestioning embracing of beauty and form. Beauty and form in relationship to my own ideas about dance and mm. what I found really powerful and right. transformative for me. Huh. And, and, and to kind of make this statement like, you know what, I'm in this section, I'm choosing to believe in this. Right. And I know it's not absolute. And I know that certain populations will come to it and feel very easy to like dive into it. And other parts of an audience base might be very skeptical and not want to embrace it. Right. But I was really interested in trying to create a really simple and direct invitation uh -huh. That just as within this space, like like I I choose to believe in this, huh. and I invite you to also yeah. for this moment, right? To 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 believe in it, and, and it's really interesting because I certainly believed in it, and I think um, I went there with you. Uh, the frame that you originally constructed um, had a lot of questions about the things that. Um, we believe in, in mm -hmm. say, the dance uh, the form itself, and um, and uh, and I know that I, I I felt like it was a courageous act, and you're critiquing your own discipline around um, do I believe in the things in this this form and the things I right, even yeah. have made over the years or things like that. Yeah. Um, having cr finished the work with this 
sumptuous, beautiful, beautifully choreographed. Han's music is, 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 is gorgeous. Um, how, do you, how do you feel now, having created it? Did you allow yourself to go there? Are you still convinced of what it is you made in the end and things in that last 20 minutes? I mean, I, you know, I, I go, uh, I'm a complicated person. <laughs> and uh, I, I go there and resist going there. And, and I feel like for one of the interesting things for me about it is to really just continue to work on it hmm. in that place of uh, vacillation. Right. Um, and there are moments when I feel like when it's really met, like the moments when, you know, like the connections that we've really worked on and spent this in inordinate amount of time trying to construct and understand. And they, the moment when that falls into place. Right. And I can watch this thing happen and I see something about like the dispersion of an impulse through an ensemble and how then it wraps back together and reunifies and fractures mm. and and how it creates a, a kind of sense of, um, I mean, even right now I'm talking about it and I kind of get chills a little yeah. bit because it, it really does some, like when that happens, then I understand something about like why I'm in this form. Hmm. And how? And what that does for me in a way that is not about a cerebral process, but uh. is something that is, is actually really deeply transformative. And, and, you know, and then I have a moment of distance and I'm like, well, yeah, you're experiencing that, but how many people see that? And right. Can you share that thing that you have as a practitioner with a public who is not a practitioner and mm. w what part of it passes and what part of it doesn't? And, and so all of that is that, that, you know, continuous back and forth of like, uh, continually re-examining it hmm. and um, and it's similar to that kind of thing I think it's, a, it's something that has to do with practice um, not practice as like rehearsal but sure. practice as yep. like daily practice mm -hmm. thing like you know some days you wake up and you just feel like you know your body feels great and you like you feel like you have a clear head and yeah. you you and you want to go and do your yoga practice. Yeah. And then other days you wake up or you want to go sit on your cushion. Right. Um, and other days you wake up and you don't feel like that. And, 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 the, and the thing about it is that it's a practice. Hmm. And you keep coming back to it. And, and in that practice then there's something that has the potential to transform you. Hmm. Um, do you ever feel in, say, the, the work last night, that um, had, we, had you not opened Act One in, in the, with, the, with the elements that you did and the first half of Act Two um, and just made that final 15 minutes, would you ever feel comfortable in a work that just is, celebrates that form and that? You know, I mean, I think I might be heading there. <laughs> I mean, in a different kind of way. Sure. I don't know that... Uh, like with the next project, I've been talking about the manifestation of the intangible hmm. and the idea that art and aesthetics is really ultimately about, as much as I really appreciate all of the conceptual frame and the intellectual discourse that surrounds art making, right. like aesthetics really starts at the moment that language like rams up against a wall and can't go any further. Right. Hmm. And, and aesthetic experience is that stuff that exists on the other side of that. Right. Um, so hmm. it's ultimately about a different way of understanding than we, than how we speak about understanding. Mm. And in some ways I'm very aware of how uh, cerebral or intellectual understanding is something that can sometimes prevent people from passing over into that other space. Right. Um, Interesting. So for me, I mean, I think, I think, uh, 
I, I, I'm, it's the thing that keeps me engaged in, in art making is some kind of like connection to that. To that emotion, would you say, or to the uh, I don't even know if it's emotion because I think emotion, again, is separate from that. But emotion mm -hmm. is a component of this thing that is much more um, about visceral experience mm -hmm. or intuitive experience. And, I, and, and frankly, like, I was in, in, in the writing that I've been doing about w what I'm thinking of trying to make this next time, I'm, I have talked about confusion. Hmm. as being like the central component of, uh, you know, when we really know and like we're in control, um, you know, our, our engagement stays in a very intellectual plane. Right. Like I know I want money because I want to buy this thing or I want to go on vacation or da 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 but like aesthetic experience doesn't, it, it, the engagement is not really so quantifiable about why. Right. Um, so there's a component of um, the unknown. You could call it confusion, you could call it the unknown. And, mm. um, and really understanding that like, like at some level religious experience and like the experience of the divine is related back to that as a kind of like, you know, aesthetic experience in some way is connected to that as kind of like a secular version. Right. Um, it's interesting because I was going to ask you in the making of th the piece we presented last night, um, in some ways you were almost, or at least its origins, on the opposite side, um, creating a critique of all things that are simply um, based on a certainty uh, or a, uh, a, maybe say in the art form, strictly a uh, aesthetic experience. Um, and I wondered as you were exploring those areas, did you ever worry that the line between questioning all, all belief structures, um, you know, is a, is a fine line toward nihilism? Um, or do you ever consider yourself, you know, sort of in that camp? Because the age we live in really right. re requires a questioning of all, all certainty and things. And did that going through that process perhaps lead you into then wanting to make this other more pure next work or well, something. Well, I mean, it, it's very like, it's funny because when I think about like this piece, there's certainly a lot of, you know, we've, we've kind of played with surface. Right. Uh, many, 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 many sur surfaces. Right. Many veneers. Um, and I think if, if we've been successful, we've actually gone deep into veneer. Mm -hmm. um, or that's when I get excited. To a point where it's no longer just veneer in a certain way. And where it's not necessarily clearly critique either. Uh-huh, right. Um, I mean, there were moments, you know, we were rehearsing a particular mm -hmm. thing. There's, you know, this genuine song and yeah. where um, there's this very overtly sexualized dancing. Right costuming, etc. And there's a moment when we were rehearsing because I had really felt like, oh, uh, like irony is something that ultimately is protective. Right. In the sense like, like explain oh, that, we're, yeah. like we're doing this thing, but we're not really doing this thing. Right. We're doing the opposite of this thing. And yeah. we're, we're really doing this thing and critiquing this thing. Right. And so don't get confused, you know. And uh, uh, the other day we were rehearsing Pony and I was just like, it's weird because when it, it gets to this place where I'm very, uh, like, I was like, I'm kind of uncomfortable with this because I'm not really, it doesn't seem obvious to me that we're not actually doing titillation. Or, yeah, 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 absolutely. Right. And as an I mean, audience member, you feel that way as ago, well. Years and years ago, when we did a piece called Accessories, which was kind of the beginning of when I, you know, it made a very big growth in terms of my career yeah. and in terms of the exposure of my work. And in it, we did this, you know, dance with breasts and penises yeah, to a rhythmic, sure. sort of a, like a folk dance, but right. super hyper anti-sexual. Right. Um, 
And I thought, okay, well, this is really like the crit the critique here is is couldn't be more obvious in many ways. And then realizing, like, over touring it to what was more places than I took any other show, that there were numerous occasions when I would encounter somebody and I would realize, like, oh, they're not. They're not reading this as a critique. They're not in on it, <laughs> in a certain way. And they don't really care to be. Right, right. You know, they may understand that that's my intention, but their engagement in it and their interest in it is much more in the direct paradigm that I'm trying to critique. Hmm. But they're just like, it's a titty show. Right. <laughs> um, and that's very, and, and a certain kind of humor about, a certain kind of awareness, but a certain fundamental level, like, like connecting directly to it and remembering being really uncomfortable at that time about that because I somehow felt like I could control that. Right. Or w had some desire to feel like that. And then, you know, gradually I feel like, you know, there are other works like Fort Blossom and Giant Empty where I felt like, oh, this is about mixing that up and purposefully allowing it to move back and forth. So right. it can move into this w you know, way of viewing and, and realizing that I don't control that. Right. The construction doesn't control it. That it's, it's, a, it's a meeting between a person with a history and a sensibility and, and a, a set of interests and whatnot with an object, which mm. is a performative object. You know. um, and so I shape that performative object, the performers do, the context does, but it, it's also really, it's about this meeting, and that right. meeting is uncontrolled. And, and um, you've said, for instance, about truth and revised histories, that you really leave it up to the audience member to determine what is, in, what is sincere or what yeah. isn't, or how much they are, it's okay to be seduced by the Right, by the and, and for instance, like when we were in LA, which is a culture I feel like is distinct maybe from an East Coast culture mm -hmm. that I come from in that there's a deeper daily engagement in veneer. Right. In some kind, I mean, I, that's a really reductivist. I don't want to sure. like say, like, that's not all of LA and that's not no. every person living in LA, but I would say there's a general truth to the water is flowing more in that direction yeah. there than for some place like in New York. And the response? Very positive and direct to those kinds of ways in which that play happens oh. in the piece. And, and then realizing like, oh, that uh, was something I hadn't really even considered. And then I had a moment of pause of like, am I comfortable with putting something into the world uh. that I feel like I want to control a certain amount, like I want, I realizing like I wanted people to be suspect or questioning mm, right. in a particular kind of way. And then I was realizing like, oh, I made this thing that people actually find pleasurable in mm. a really direct way of like, we're gonna engage in that and we're gonna engage in this and we're gonna engage in that. And uh. we're not really gonna question whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, the way we're slipping around and right. engaging in these things and, and investing and then divesting immediately. Uh, um, and in the end, was that okay with you? The audiences responded in LA in that way? It, okay, not okay. Yeah. It's interesting to me. Right. I don't it's know really quite what to do with that. Certain amount of giving up control over the yeah. response to yeah. the work. Yeah. And then, and then realize, I mean, I feel like that's something in, in my, um, time in this field has increasingly become like a realization like, oh, you just really, you need to let go. Right, yeah. Like, you can't, I'm more interested in not, in just, in, in noticing it. Hmm. And not, and, and there are ways in which it makes me uncomfortable. Right. And then noticing that. Huh. And then trying to think, like, well, what does that mean? And what does right. that mean about what I want to make yeah. from here on out or tomorrow? Because hmm. um, I don't think I can even make statements about what I want from here on out. I can right. just kind of right. say, well, like, the next step I want to go in this direction. 
Do you um, see um, your work as, I mean, the, the topics that you took on in, in Truth Revised Histories is, were, are pretty heady and, and fairly yeah. philosophical. They're, yeah. they're, they're, some of them are core basic questions about who we are as people and what it is that we believe. Do you see the role of a dance maker in, con in contemporary times as uh, in part be or fully being a public intellectual, as being a responsibility around raising questions for the public at large? And then what, if so, or at all, um, what are the challenges of doing that through the body rather than through text and words? Well, I think um, if I were to try and sort of like hone in the center of what I think, uh, uh, yeah, one as an artist who is creating a public exchange. Right. So differentiated from somebody who's kind of doing their exploration that isn't about making public exchange. I don't mean confined to a theater or mm -hmm. a gallery, but somehow like, you make some experience somehow, whether it's a piece of fixed artwork or a performance or whatever right. it is, and somehow other people come and experience it. Yeah. Um, so to me, well, both of them, I think, have to do with awakening, like, mm -hmm. like trying to create experiences or something that, that elicit that. And, and I think in both cases, whether or not you're inviting a public, I do ultimately feel like that's a, that's a responsibility that's in relationship to myself right. as a maker. And then if I'm going to bring other people into the experience, I've added that extra responsibility of trying to cre create some kind of awakening. Right. Now, uh. and that's in relationship to feeling like, like, you know, like there's a lot of forces at at large that encourage us kind of going to sleep. Right. Um, hmm. So what that exactly means in terms of, is that an intellectual engagement? Is it a philosophical engagement? Is it uh, a sociological hmm. awakening? Right. Like all of those kinds of things. I think that's much more individual question for, for um, the field of research of the, of the artist. So I wouldn't make a global statement right. about like art needs to be this. Right. Or um, dance should be today yeah. if to it's relevant. Dance, right. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like that's that's a much but I do feel like there's got to be some like something right. about like enlivening or awakening or I don't really get what it's doing. Right. Um, and I even mean that in relationship to forms that are really historical. Hmm. Like, because I feel like the, the, the question about the historical artist then, or somebody who's working in a historical tradition. Say ballet. Or yeah, like somebody making a, new, a neoclassic ballet mm -hmm. right now, or a neoclassic, or a, a classic story ballet. Like, right. you're gonna, like, even that, you got a responsibility to somehow create an enlivened experience. So within that very defined field, I would say that person still, responsible to, to, to innovate in, in a small, like to, to find something that's gonna, you know, right. make the souffle rise. Right. Um, for lack of a better way of talking about it. And so, to me, that's, that's kind of the, the question. And, and I know that I'm somebody who, um, thinks a lot, <laughs> you know, probably too much. Um, and so for me, when I talk about that and philosophical or that kind of engagement, that, that um, is just something that comes up. And then mm. I feel like, I, you know, half of making work for me has been like a vehicle to, to deal with those questions. Mm that right. are there anyway. Sure. Um, there for you or there for the world at large? Well, I think they're d clearly there for right. the world right. and whether or not you're engaging them hmm. in them or not and or, you know, you're going shopping at Bed Bath & Beyond, right. um, which I do 
<laughs> or, or other versions of that. I'm not such a fan of Bed Bath & Beyond, but you know, I do plenty of things to move my mind and attention away from these uh, things that I feel like I don't know how to deal with. Right. Um, so uh, uh, distraction, as much as I would say, is not a good thing on the totality. All of us need some relief to be able to return back to things. So, um, hmm. so I believe that, you know, like we, we as human beings need some kind of mechanisms to, to deal with the situations that we're in. Um, and distraction can be one of those. So I'm not like, when we always have to be arduously thinking about world right. problems and, or like the philosophical, you know, like, what does it mean to be alive? Right. <laughs> um, but since those are things that I think about um, quite a lot or from time to time, and I spend a lot of kind of questioning about that, then, then making work has kind of um, been a vehicle for, for exploring that. And, and interestingly enough, I think making work has also been a vehicle for me for questioning that. Right. Um, you know, and like my engagement in dance again is in some way, it's about like, in part, sometimes finding a way to explore these concepts and sometimes creating a space where I can invest in something that expands out from that. And, and, mm -hmm makes me realize like it's not just about think 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 it's you know there there are a lot of ways in which like the body can think hmm. yeah like and you can experientially engage in something that is is akin to thought process. Physically maybe, intellectual yeah. in yeah. a certain way. Yeah. And, and we, had, uh, you know, here at the Walker spend a lot of time looking at what are these different forms good at or who, right. w where is it appropriate, maybe not appropriate, but what are the traditions that have led up, say, to dance as we know it now versus visual art practice and where are those lines mm -hmm. interestingly crossed? Right. You know, you could j maybe generalize by saying the theater forms have generally been more open to a emotion, um, and, uh, and the, maybe the gallery forms have been more uh, intellectually right. exploratory. Um, but the lines are blurring in interesting ways. And do you find that you're inspired by visual art practice, uh, or in any yeah. way interested in, in, you know, pushing these live performing art forms into more rigorous intellectual practice in the way that visual artists I, have? I, I long feel done like I've really, really tried, or I, at least in my own way, I feel like I've tried. Right. Um, uh, and I feel like visual art for forever has been extremely um, inspiring to me and also really inspiring the way in which discourse exists at a certain level and prominence inside the visual art community mm. that I kind of crave. Right. Um, that has never really been the case across the board in, in my experience of the dancer performance world. Um, and that's mm. not to say that there aren't really smart, um, astute people writing significant discourse around our field, but um, it's not as common right. as it is in the visual art world. And, and I think that's partly because dance, you know, Because it's a body and you're looking at bodies and there are all these issues that are like, like ageism and uh, certain kinds of things about like watching virtuosity mm -hmm. that are embedded in the tradition of it. Mm. it. It's sometimes difficult to get that really moving. Mm. But I will say one thing that, uh, you know, like as, as I kind of continue, I do think that, that uh, I've begun to realize like, oh, 
I'm doing this thing. And by trying to make this thing manifest all of the positive attributes of that thing. That thing meaning? Well, just say, in this particular say, case, visual art. You're right. You know, I may be um, missing an opportunity of what this particular form really has to offer. Right. Um, that's distinct from that form. And I mean that in terms of dance and performance or, you know, movement arts. Right, <laughs> right. Um, as opposed to visual art, but I also mean it in relationship to performance and art making as opposed to discourse and essays and right. writing and and to me I'm interested in that in in the richness of the discourse mm -hmm. but the one of the things that I am really committed to is like all of that discourse surrounds a sur may surround the work and may support the work and may give ways in which it creates channels for people to approach the work yeah. but it is not the work right and it isn't the experience that, and, and ultimately those two things are distinct. And in that regard, um, it's interesting to me to really understand, well, what is it that, that is still going to be like, I can read about X, Y, and Z performance all I want, but when I go and uh -huh. I actually engage in it, ultimately, if it's a positive experience, something's gonna like. There's gonna be a shift or something that is is going to extend beyond the scope of what can actually be written. Um, and and it, would you go so far as to use the word a kind of magic? I mean, you used yeah. magic. There's yeah. a theatrical yeah. energy that can transmit in a way that maybe other forms yeah. can't. And whether that's about you know trying to convince people that this thing is happening when it's not or right. or whatever that means yeah um but yes mm. yes i would say that mm. and i and i would um because otherwise you know if we're we're just doing and that's something about the title that i feel like you know i've gotten i have gotten criticism about like oh it's this like who are you <laughs> monolith like <laughs> You know, it's a brick house of a title, um, which is intentional in this particular instance of like, you know, it's like um, even, even in some kind of a way, the conceit of trying to address these right. issues in making a performance Have people is said already... Like presumptuous or... Uh, well, not only is it presumptuous, but uh, I mean, it is. And it's intentionally so because right. I feel like it's yet again another one of these questions about like is that even real? Right. Yeah. The title. Or exactly. Yeah. Like the, or the pretense <laughs> that we can somehow address these things right. in this in this particular form. Sure. Uh, I'd like to ask a couple of questions in in how you actually made this work last night, um, in the structures, um, the series, how, how you. Um, decided uh, in the order of the of the of the different vignettes or, or scenes that you created clearly you started with a duality of um, of two acts and of but I didn't actually oh but yeah. I mean I mean that the two uh -huh. act structure when did came that come? Much, uh. well we premiered in in Dresden uh -huh. uh, Germany at a space this is co-production with Foresight company so they have right. two resident spaces in Dresden where we premiered um, the space that they um, do all of their performances is the Festspielhaus Hellerau, uh -huh. um, which is just outside of Dresden and is actually has a very long relationship back to performance because it's where Eurythmy and Dalcrow started. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, huh. Literally, like in that same <laughs> building. Um, and it was built as a kind of, you know, new world vision of like what theater could be and mm. in totally white interior. That's where the white columns I've yeah, seen images yeah, exactly. from. Uh -huh, so right. it's a very like sort of almost um, 
ironically pre fascism, but very fascist right. architecture of like these enormous white monumental, granite right. monumental columns and you know, the first performances there, they had did all this stuff with silk and diffusion and lighting, uh, lighting performances uh. with, with, so it, uh, to me, because of that history, you know, that lasted with Bauhaus maybe like 12 years before that all ended at Hellerau. Right, and then yeah. it became like a, um, like in, after the 40s, like a, a Russian cultural community center. Mm. Um, and then was empty for quite a while before they renovated the whole place and made it back into a theater. But because of that, like, w white, gleaming white architecture, right. and it really was like, originally I felt like, you know, it just seems really strange to be going into this piece of architecture that is, has such a history that's so much about the rejection of all of these conventions, and then just bring, like, <laughs> you know, like, all of the conventions of sort of like theatrical history and the black right. box and the, right. you know, wings and proscenium stages and all of those things, just sort of like pretend like we're not actually in this right. building. So um, in a way that made me feel like, oh, well, if we're gonna do this other thing, we, you know, and then the duality of like the, the very simple kind of contrast of like, oh, black, white. right. Um, and the opportunity to work on something that was so, you know, like really dividing it. And then it felt like the whole conceit of acts and an intermission, and, uh -huh. you know, like a, a truncated experience that is in segments. Um, and the tradition of that felt like something interesting to work with, which is distinct from any other show that I'd ever done. Hmm. Um, and, and directly parallel this question of yeah. truth and yeah. lies. and. To me, it did. Yeah. yeah, there was a there was a link up. So, yeah. a lot of that, you know, again, I think happens pretty. You start with a set of questions, or at right. least I'm not going to say you. I start with some questions, yeah. um, but I really have no idea where where where. The, I mean, I have some ideas, but I don't have an idea or a picture in my head of where the show is going to end up. Hmm. I and feel like I start with some things and then I'm like, oh, that relates to that. And then I start, you know, bringing that into the studio and there are, you know, ideas or objects that, when I say that, it's a little bit like moving things around. And then you begin arranging and you're right. like, oh, I don't, like, this doesn't really fit in the set, that set anymore. And the set is, hmm. now that we've got eight things in here, then I look at the set and I'm like, well, what is this? And what is right. it, what else is it like? And do you, you suss know, things what out else with is like that, your you know? dancers and ask oh, them? Oh, yeah, 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 They're yeah, adding yeah, ideas. They're or very or much so. a big, big, big part of the process. Because they're, they're, they're the ones that are in the room. Right. Every day. Yeah. Um, and will so they sometimes say, we don't, we don't think this idea is working, or w w someone will bring in a new movement idea or uh, other? Yeah, they definitely have that. And, uh -huh. and that comes on many, many different levels. Sometimes mm. it's a micro level of like, management of a movement, like a purely movement thing or a spacing thing right. or whatnot, but certainly in terms of like conceptual ideas and us talking about why we're doing what we're doing and ideas that can come in from people about where something might go. Hmm. And sometimes posed by a question, you know, that I brought in. Yeah. And, and do you, you, your own role in, the, in this work, um, <laughs> it, was that always from the start? You were, no. You're kind of a sly um, uh, kind of uh, right. commentator on uh, things. You, you enter well, in Jimmy and out. Jimmy Leary re brought up that she thought that my role reminded her of the wizard in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Who is that? She's a um, dance, um, performance person uh -huh. was in New York, uh -huh. um, worked with many different people, Sarah Mitchelson uh -huh. for a while, and started this thing called Ants, um, and then she now lives in LA, and she just interviewed me for Critical Correspondence, uh -huh. which is an online journal oh, through interesting. research. Did you agree with her um, description of your, your role? I did, I mean, it was, it was um, humbling, um, but I think it's correct. I mean, you know, I've been 
Anyway, there's a, there's something humble, like you know, he's kind of like a an awkward, like he, you know, in that film, he's kind of like some guy, like a you know, kind of socially awkward guy from Nebraska, Kansas, or yeah. I think he's from Nebraska. Oh, if I uh -huh. remember. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he wanted to hide behind things, pull the strings, but ultimately was shown to be. Uh, a fake kind of. Uh, well, but also genuine in some yeah, other. Sure. Much more um, emotionally kind of genuine. Yeah. About, yeah. He's he's kind of a a regular guy. Yeah. Um. He, and I think you know there there's there are ways in which like I feel like that kind of um, like my role originally I was going to be more in it and then I think. As time went on, I just, I still have this, uh, you know, perpetual nagging issue about what it means to be um, an, a dancer who is, or a, you know, a performer who's aging in an ensemble that is um, of a different age group. Hmm. And the singularity of that as like author hmm. in relationship to an ensemble that is involved in authorship, but in a different way. And is of a different gen generation. And, uh, yeah, certainly. that's what I mean, mm. yeah. You, Whereas I used to work really with my peers, or right. largely my peers. I mean, even if there was a slight age gap, the age gap was small enough so that it was not, um, it didn't have the prominence that it now has. Mm. And I think since the time when that gap became larger, I'm still trying to figure out what that paradigm is. Mm. Um, and whether that means that I'm no longer engaged in the act of performing, or um, if I am, how, mm. and how to avoid the sort of like uh, archetypal construction of the choreographer solo in the, um, stuck in the ensemble of whatnot. I feel like it, ha it need, there needs to be more identity for me or I shouldn't be there at all. Mm. Um, Merce continued to have a role in sometimes in his work. Yeah, and I mean, years. you know, obviously I'm like like the distance between Merce and his company at the end of his life was much less, or was more acute. Right. What I'm sure, speaking of absolutely. in this is much less right. acute than that. Yeah. But there are questions that I feel like I'm, I'm interested in asking before, you know, like. Right. Right as it as it, as it's emerging, I want to understand something about it. Mm. Um, you also um, choreographed a, a fair amount of emptiness in this space, and I wanted to ask about the moments. You know, you 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 had to shape rhythm of no one in or just yourself with in black leotards against the black background, and how you how you defined the length and the the use because that's quite adept at how you dealt with the emptiness and huh. I mean I maybe this is a sort of like pretentious to say but I always sort of feel like you're always shaping emptiness hmm. or I feel like that's what a maybe that, tells you, maybe that tells you more about <laughs> me than I should be revealing. <laughs> because but you're always dealing with time and... Uh, yeah, and things are just that, the, the, you know, things are things, and things are also the edges of the space in between the things. Right, and the non-things. And, that's, and yeah. tr that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So, you know, like whether it's, you know, it's not just a figure here and a figure here, but the, the figures here define a space that is empty in between them. And right. that exists in space and it exists in time. Yeah. Um, and so, um, to me, like, when you think about, like, uh, rhythm, like, phrasing, all of that is about organizing presence and absence. Mm. Um, you know. Right. In terms of, you know, think about like s s music, it, like the rest is basically a void. Hmm. <laughs> right, right. You know, so, um, 
so when you think of all of those things are the same things, whether it's, you know, like, oh, I placed an object over here, but like, what is that, how does that define a negative space here or, right. or over there? And yeah. what is it, you know, how is this person here or this figure, what, whatever it is, whether it's a piece of scenery or a, you know, a person relate to, to whatever the empty space is that's around them. Right. So Could how you, things get f filled up, and and I feel like that's an energetic thing too. Like you know, like, uh, like, like constructing the inflation and collapse of the souffle. Right. Um, so uh. that you get like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, doesn't really exist without the right. energy that precedes it. And does that take a long time to, to, to work on that ebb and flow? And yeah. Do you continue to work on it uh, even now? or uh, is I it think we continue to work on it in how we're doing it. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, there are other artists. Bill Forsythe is a perfect example of somebody who's constantly radically ripping <laughs> the, the bones of the thing apart right. on a regular basis. Yeah, I don't know whether it's just a personality sensibility, but I just don't. Right. I don't have that. That's not who I am. I mean, I feel like I'm more interested in like, okay, here's the frame that we're working with, and yes, being open to maybe we really need to get rid of this chunk at some point if right. it becomes clear. Yeah. But um, I always feel like, uh, you know, moving a piece out of a puzzle is not about that piece in the puzzle, it's about its relationship to all of these different things. Mm, right. So when you pull a piece of the puzzle yeah. out, w just one, there's a kind of refraction that can move right. outwards, so suddenly it's just like, oh my god, I have to really think about all those different <laughs> things right. in which how that thing changes, and having taken enough time to sort of like try and figure that out, then I feel like, um, uh, I'm not somebody who likes to move all of those things around just willy-nilly because it, it, right. I, I feel like I can't even see what it is anymore. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like then it becomes this question about like, well, well, how do we deal with the thing? And in between the premiere, for instance, and these tour, touring dates that we have, there are things that we, you know, we never even talked about or, mm. or f frankly had time to think about. In, um, in the making of the work, but then mm. returning to, to sort of like certain known things then allows you to kind of figure out what they really are. Right. And how you want to approach m in a more uh, maybe refined way yeah. um, those things. And then, and then from there, much more subtle changes have happened inside of the thing, trying right. to sort of examine, like, well, this is what we really want to get at here, and so, like, how do we, how do we shape that? Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Do, do, you, um, do you find this coming through, you're finished with this work, you're thinking about the next piece, we're in a point in time in, you know, culturally, or I mean, say in dance development, that some view as, um, as a, you know, uniquely challenging. Do you, is this a, hope, a hopeful moment, would you say, for your own work uh, or for uh, the, the form of dance in general? Or, or, or do you find it a, a, a difficult moment? And that you may have to answer that for... Well, first thing, I think a hopeful moment is about you. Hmm. Yeah. Like about any individual, right. any moment. Yeah. Is, is an individual question uh, then. Uh, about how you want to position yourself to, how you as an individual want to position yourself to the circumstances that, that you're in. I mean, sure, we could like, all, we, anybody could sit in this chair and talk about how the challenges of funding and right. how that, the, the, you know, economy has, has made that a, a difficult paradigm more difficult. How, you know, the arts in general are going to be challenged because we have so many different social agendas which are really, really important. 
um, that become more and more, you know, and as an economic crisis begins to sort of like continue to ripple. So now you have all of this stuff happening in Greece and Europe and right. what's going to happen with Europe and how's that going to affect world economy and what's right. that going to mean to our stock market and how's the stock market going to relate to the foundation and blah, 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 blah. Yep. Like we could, we could talk on and on about how there's a lot of unknown right. um, and a lot of need for the social culture to really ask some really tough questions about w what do we want to do moving forward and where do we want to put our resources um, so hope is just how you deal with that situation. To decide to be hopeful or in despair, um, because any situation has opportunity mm -hmm. embedded in it, and it may not be the opportunity of big fancy performances. Right. It may be a really distinct, different opportunity, but. It's just a matter of like sitting down and positioning yourself like, well, how open are you to what the real possibility huh. of, of what's in front of you? Because there's always something. Right. Um, and, and sometimes those things are really tough because it might, you know, it might mean like who you think you are and what you think the world is supposed to think about you. Mm -hmm. maybe, the, the, maybe the opportunity is something different. And so ultimately the first response would be to be like, well, I don't want that opportunity. Right. I want this other thing. But or, or I want to keep doing what I've gotten good at or that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's always really tricky because it's like, that's what, and we had a conversation just the other day where we were talking about, you know, dance. And I, and I said something about like, you know, dance is a, I guess I even went so far as to say it's like a dying art form in the sense that, um, and I don't mean that across the board. And that might've led to my question. Or something. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I think like, uh, Automation is not something new. Um, th the power of amplification and all of like the ways in which technology gives us the possibility of doing these things. Right. Like you look at a movie, like you look at Avatar, yeah. for instance, which I'm sure 15 years from now, we're going to look at it and be like, oh my God, that's so like stupid <laughs> and quaint and how like crappy the technology is. So and 2009. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, there's the po this complex possibility of like all these different things, you know, and as it becomes like technology moves from, you know, image related technology moves from 2D to 3D and blah, blah, blah. Like, like I'm sure that there's going to be a process where the body, you know, that same old body that we all had, you know, several thousand years ago, like, like, it's been around, yeah, it's been slowly, <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're doing some improvements on right. <laughs> body, you know, version 2009.7. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't evolve at the same level that technology is going to evolve in terms of opportunities and for it to suddenly do some other thing. And are you I speaking mean, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a creator who uses the body in particular? I'm also... Speaking of a creator who uses the body in a highly artisanal form. Hmm. So we go into the studio and we spend a really long time thinking about things that if anybody from the general public came in, they would think like, what the <laughs> hell is wrong with you people? Like, and why could you, why do you possibly care about these things? Because the value system really pushes quite dramatically against the, I mean, the larger, and that creates an economic paradigm of right. like time, space, that all costs things in the real world that's changing in a particular kind of way. Like 
that becomes more and more difficult to fund because it's like, well, yeah, you have this dance performance, but like, how many hours do you have to spend in the studio, and how, like, and trying to support those people right. who, and support them to develop the skills so they can. So that's where there's this thing about like, I feel like you know, somebody was telling me about this. They were really interested in millinery, hmm. hat making. Between 1940 and today. There are all of these techniques of making hats that are completely lost. Hmm. They can make kind of coarse, you know, Replication replications of it. of it, but there are existing hats that they're like, we don't know how they made, how they did it. Hmm. To, I mean, yeah, they can kind of do it, um, but they can't make the level of refined version. That's in 60 years, 50 years. Hmm. purely based on the fact that all those people died with the information that they had. And it was never really passed on because nobody was really interested in it. Hmm. Is that bad? I don't know. But it's a change. It represents a change. And it represents a, a thing that like, like at a certain moment in time, people were really interested in this. The culture was really interested in it. And the interest in it, it wasn't like suddenly people didn't, weren't interested in fashion or how right. they got dressed up or whatnot, but it shifted. Yeah. And when I talk about dance as a dying form, I, I, I do feel like probably, you know, I don't know how much time the culture is going to be able to sustain this interest in this really specific way of relating to the body. Hmm. What I know is that I believe in it in some kind of a way. Um, that it's the card that I am dealt. Mm. So, um, I can always change, you know, I can, you know, like I can give me three cards from the dealer and put some other ones down. Like that's a life choice. But I also feel like uh, it's one of those things where I don't, I mean, many, many, many years ago I was on a panel and like somebody said, well, like, we don't want to be marginalized. Like it was right. in the, all of like the, you know, culture wars of the mid 80s or right. whatnot. And I was like, who the hell are you kidding? Like, how am I, like, we are marginal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and that isn't bad. Huh. Like that, that's, in fact, I understand why I'm marginal. Like, when I look at the tea party, I'm like, I want to be marginal. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like, I don't want to be part of that mainstream. Right. And there's, there's a reason for that. You know, there's a, there's a, uh, and I don't feel like I want to feel bad about, yeah. like, I'm not Madonna. You know, I, I understand why I'm right. in the position that I am. Now, there's, uh, you, one doesn't want to go too far. Right. Um, and 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 it's important to to defend the importance of minority voices as vibrant aspects of the conversation. Right. Um, but uh, it's also important, I think, to realize like that um, not being at the center is really okay. In fact, may have its own real power. Well, I think so. I think if you're pretending and sort of frustrated about not being at the center while not being at the center, y you're almost not seeing your opportunity. Right. You know? Yeah. And, and that's where I get back to this whole thing about like, I, I, I could envision that what I'm doing, the information that I'm doing, may not necessarily be like, like I'm part of a trajectory. Right. And, and um, I think where we get, or at least where I feel like I get confused is that I forget that, mm. you know. And I get frustrated that, you know, I was just thinking about issues of age and passage of time and new voices emerging. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, 
I totally, I, that's what needs to happen. Right. And, but it's a very tricky thing because here, you know, as an individual, like, um, and particularly as an artist, because you're already sort of like disenfranchised from the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, you're in a relatively, um, uh, you're in a funny position from the onset. And then there's a way in which like the, you know, particularly because contemporary performance is really about the new and the emerging and right. da, 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 there's all this focus here that is ultimately in some way ageist and then mm -hmm. you realize like oh you're moving out of that and I feel like that mm. I feel like I am moving out of the young mm. right. um, or have moved out of the young I wouldn't I'm not in the old but right. I'm you know there is a shift and then realizing like that and then there's a shift of attention and a, and and you know, I made a piece, Becky, Jody, and John, that was really mm -hmm. about like trying to come to terms with the fact that there is, there's a, a process by which within a certain discourse you become more and more irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, or that your, the specificity of the location of your relevancy shifts. Right. And I think that to me, that gets back to that same thing. Like I may want to be X, Y, and Z, but if I, focus all my energy over here, saying I want to hold on to this place, right. I don't see the opportunity for how my relevancy is shifting, yeah. you know. But that means like sort of stepping back and looking at a really, really bigger picture right. that can be oftentimes quite humbling. Um, John, it's been a great pleasure oh. to not <laughs> just have uh, you here in making this new work and um, being able to support it and capture this little moment that we have uh, in the greater spectrum of, uh, of the world of art, but also great to have this moment together and to yeah. be able to talk about these issues. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you.